interviewing the leading private equity executives and unlocking the secrets of success. Welcome to the Private Equity Podcast with Alex Rawlings. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Private Equity Podcast. Joining us today is Tim O'Reilly, a private equity-backed chief financial officer who's going to share his insights, and thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Alex. Appreciate being here. Tim, as is customary on the podcast, if you could share with us a 60 to 90 second breakdown of you, please. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Alex. I uh, appreciate you inviting me. I've been listening to your podcast for a while. Uh, and uh, one of my great mentors, Adam, was on this. Adam Coffey was on this a couple times, I saw. So appreciate being uh, invited to, to participate in a podcast that he's, a, he's also participated in. Uh, my name's Tim O'Reilly. Uh, I've got a beautiful wife who I met at move-in day at college at the University of Central Florida. And we've since had two beautiful children, um, one uh, eight-year-old son and a two-year-old daughter. I studied finance and accounting at UCF. I I did, um, right before my son was born, I was uh, studying for my MBA, my CPA, my CGMA, (laughs) all at the same time, and found out that I had had passed uh, all three right before the day my son came home from the hospital. So it was great relief and then um, moved, uh, you know, from from there, started my career in public accounting. Um, I found myself having more interest in the business than I did the actual audit procedures and knew that I had some entrepreneurial spirit that, uh, that I wanted to tap into. So shortly after public accounting, I, I moved to, um, I was offered a position with Verizon uh, communications to, to be a part of their finance transformation effort. So spent many years uh, there uh, transitioning finance-based uh, tasks from uh, corporate headquarters up in New Jersey to a, to a finance um, hub in Lake Mary, Florida, and learned a lot doing that, learned a lot about uh, publicly traded businesses through the process as well, system implementations, you name it. Uh, from there, I, I, uh, I was recruited uh, by a up and coming uh, software company, uh, a, a SaaS based software company uh, out of Tampa, Florida, a group called ConnectWise. Um, and they were in the position to try to get ready for an IPO. So taking all of that public company knowledge and, and translating that into uh, establishing you know, appropriate controls, establishing uh, what a company needed to do in order to be prepared uh, for an IPO, and uh, was, was blessed with some great mentors. Eileen Kamarek was the CFO at that time and learned a lot from her. From there, I moved to another, uh, another software business. Uh, recently, it was recently purchased uh, by private equity when I joined. Uh, a private equity group based out of Silicon Valley had purchased uh, the world's largest low vision and blindness software company and had actually consolidated and combined that with another uh, group outside of the U.S. and, and uh, in the Netherlands. So uh, matched hardware and software together. It was a great uh, opportunity, great way for me to cut my teeth with private equity and met another mentor there um, who uh, Rick Simpson was our CFO. Um, <clears throat> who prepared me for my first CFO position, which was with Dell Air Heating and Air Conditioning, uh, a large, large, probably the largest in Florida, uh, uh, servicing um, the Florida markets, eight different markets we served um, for heating, electrical, and plumbing. Uh, from there, I am currently uh, a CFO for Frontier Service Partners, uh, backed by a private equity group uh, named Imperial Capital, a phenomenal group that we've partnered with to uh, acquire uh, businesses um, also in the HVAC plumbing electrical space. And then one fun fact about me is similar to Adam Coffey and why we connected uh, so quickly as I also am a private pilot. I ended up sneaking in a private pilot license in between uh, my CFO role at Del Air and uh, at Frontier Service Partners. 
So again, thank you. Excited to be here. Excited to uh, help uh, any of your listeners, hopefully, um, to, uh, to, to, to make a connection on, on why I think private equity is so exciting. I definitely agree. Private equity is exciting. It's a great industry to be in. Uh, get some bad rap like any other industry, but is phenomenal and helps a lot of people, helps a lot of businesses and does a lot of great in the uh, in the world. Um, yeah. So, yeah, Adam's obviously been on the I think there's only Adam and Nevin that have been on the podcast twice. So uh, uh, a bit of a rare, rare, uh, rare feat. But Adam's story is uh, uh, somewhat uh, impressive, to say the very least. So uh, it was great to have him on board. Uh, and talking so and always uh, always pleased to hear of a, another listener in the uh, on the podcast Tim so thanks for uh, thanks for listening so what one mistake do you see either private equity firms or portfolio companies making Tim and what actions would you suggest to correct them look this is a great question I think you, you ask it almost on every podcast and uh, it's, a, it's a great question because you know private equity firms have had to evolve uh, it's not the same as it was you know five to ten years ago not even uh, when I first uh, started in private equity five years ago, um, these these firms have had to uh, to evolve from you know the underlying mission, which has not changed, uh, is to deliver great return to investors, right? So that that mission has not changed, but the way we go about uh, delivering that value or delivering that return has changed significantly. You can't today, uh, it's no longer about just buying companies and stacking revenue and stacking EBITDA. Uh, There's much more under the surface. These businesses are much more complex. Uh, The environment is much more complex. So a lot of that has, has, you know, driven uh, a lot of these private equity groups to, to build, uh, build out uh, theses that are that extend beyond their hold period, which is which is phenomenal, right? And it kind of goes back to the three P's: people, profit, uh, and planet. And um, where we used to see it being, you know, one P profit, <laughs> we've started to see a lot of private equity groups shift towards understanding people. People come first, right? Uh, people and processes. There's maybe another fourth P in there that we've added. And, uh, and process is really important as we get to later in the podcast, I think. Uh, but people is one where it all starts with. We've, we've uh, done a lot of homework uh, to, to make sure we're par- partnering with the right people. I've done a lot of homework. A lot of executives in the space do a lot of homework before they partner with a PE firm to make sure that there's alignment there. Um, so I, I do think, you know, you know, one mistake that could be made is if you haven't evolved uh, yet to understand that there, it's a deeper, more complex uh, space than uh, where it was. And it, it used to have a bad rap, but uh, I'll tell you the, the, the groups that um, I've been fortunate enough to work with have done a great job evolving these businesses and, and making sure that, you know, you're not leaving value on the table because you're only kind of one, one track mindset. So, um, you know, actions I think most groups took to, to correct some of these mistakes uh, from, from prior years is, is uh, really, again, building out that, that thesis that extends beyond three to five years. Um, making sure that there's a long-term thesis at play. Businesses are long-term by nature. You talk to most entrepreneurs, they're thinking five, 10, 15 years out. They're not thinking about just what's in front of them. Um, and so, so as a, as a private equity group building a thesis, uh, the more valuable and more value created, uh, the more, uh, the firms that are creating the most value are building these theses beyond five years. Um, what does that mean? It means, you know, what are, what are the pieces of the platform that we need to build out outside of just m a right uh, a lot of private equity focuses on m a it's great it's it's you know it's, it is the lifeblood of private equity but there are pieces underneath that that create some sustainable competitive that advantage that gives you more value in the marketplace on a long-term basis you know in in our industry is you know, making sure that you have a sustainable labor force if labor is important, making sure you've got su- sustainable uh, practices to develop technology if it's tech, if a tech based company or making sure that you're staying ahead of standards, regulatory environments, those pieces. 
um, as well as making sure that you know you you are reevaluating these businesses to to grow organically and not through just M and A. Um, we've seen businesses in our space trade for really high multiples. And the reason for that is because a lot of the private equity groups have invested beyond just M&A. They've reinvested back into these businesses to grow people, to improve processes. And uh, I think that's, you know, one of the biggest steps to correcting some of the, some of the, you know, uh, unfavorable opinions that some folks may have had about private equity years ago. Uh, I've seen that change firsthandedly, and I think um, you know it's a really exciting space to get into today, uh, with a lot of like-minded people that are that are driving these businesses and want to drive these businesses to long-term success, not just success within their hold period. No, I saw. I like the analogy with the or the the set out with regards to you know the four P's and and focused on that and you know not just profit anymore. You know, working on the other areas, people, and certainly systems or not. Or should we say processes for consistent peas uh, to run with that? So yeah, definitely, uh, definitely an important element. So Tim, you've got a lot of experience in what I regard as the, the kind of business service type environment, which in essence includes for you technology kind of software businesses, but also what we kind of see as like industrial services, field services type businesses. What, what are some of the insights that you're seeing across those kind of spaces? But also, what do you kind of predict for this space of, over the next 12 to 24 months? Yeah, Alex, and again, another great question. I think uh, any, any executive in, the, in, the, in a service-based business today has also had, you know, we, we're going to continue to talk about the word evolve, but um, there, there's some key principles that have, have stayed the same uh, for service-based businesses. And, and that applies to whether you're a technology software service, uh, or whether you're, uh, running a business that has HVAC plumbing, electrical technicians, like I am today. Um, and it all starts about, it, it all goes back to creating value for customers, right? So you create values for your employees, for your customers, for your investors. And, uh, and it starts by understanding your customers, right? I think one place in the next, 12 to 24 months, at least in our space, um, is, is understanding the labor market and understanding who is driving that value for your customer. So um, you'll hear Richard Branson say this a lot, um, and it holds true to almost every business, is invest in your people, train your people, get your people excited about a mission uh, that they're a part of, and typically you're going to create v- great value for your customers. It's not enough just to invest in your employees, but um, that's where I see a lot of a lot of the great service-based businesses going is dedicating more resources, more time, more talent, more treasure, uh, money to those to those buckets, to that bucket to, to really grow the employee base. So I see in the next 12 to 24 months you're going to see a, a huge pickup in I, I, in my opinion in, in these in the service-based industry on recruiting. Uh, there is a, 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 a need in our space for great qualified technicians that can go into a home, uh, make a customer feel uh, safe and that they're well taken care of. It's very hard to find that talent and mix with that all of the skills and expertise that are required in order to uh, fix complex systems in your home. Same with the technology space, right? Um, depending on whether you're a direct to consumer or B2B uh, tech solution, uh, you've got to be able to, to, you know, invest in the, in the developers who are, who are driving, uh, and look for new developers that are, have new ideas and, and, you know, kind of challenge the status quo of the tech, uh, in order to grow and adapt and evolve there. So peeling all of that back, I think, you know, big principles that are going to be key differentiators for for service-based businesses in the next 12 to 24 months, especially with market uncertainty, is it's it's the time is now to reevaluate your business. And what I mean with that is, you know, look at your current relationships. Um, so outside of your employees, you've got to build strong relationships, long-term relationships with customers. So uh, less of the shiny object, more of something that will keep you coming back in both of these spaces. Service-based businesses need recurring, uh, recurring revenue streams, recurring customers, 
uh, in order to build that true value for the investors as well. So creating a relationship with a customer uh, that, that you know is going to last long term, that they're going to want to come back to you uh, is important in this next 12 to 24 months and, and beyond that. That's kind of basic blocking and tackling maintenance items. But then the, the other piece uh, that, that I see uh, that's going to become important um, it, over the next uh, year or so is being responsive and, and, and being in a position to execute. Usually in times of market uncertainty, um, there are folks who accelerate businesses and grow businesses, and there's folks that will slow down. The ones who are best positioned to accelerate businesses during times of uncertainty are the ones who are best prepared, right? So um, as a finance uh, professional, cash is king. Uh, that goes without saying, being prepared to make sure that you know, you've got your treasury in order from a financial perspective is important to be able to make timely decisions and investment, invest in areas where maybe there's an opportunity. Um, that could be labor, that could be other businesses that uh, need help. Uh, that could be in um, expanding on technology that, uh, you know, leaning in and developing new technology that is going to uh, position a customer to not have to make a decision on whether he's going to buy, he or she's going to buy your software or uh, ask for your service over something else. So um, when times are tough and you're faced with ultimatum based decisions and you're a service based business, you've got to be able to uh, reevaluate and clearly define that the value you're creating is worth selecting for a customer. One of the areas um, that I've found is very helpful uh, and re in the reevaluation process for uh, service-based businesses is, is a, uh, it's not my, my thought. It was, uh, you know, someone much smarter than me had created uh, for the four helpful lists, right? And it's something we revisit uh, at, uh, we've revisited uh, multiple times at multiple companies and, and it's, uh, you know, what's going right? Uh, is the first question you ask and then you make a list, right? You get, you get all the key stakeholders of the room, what's going right? Um, let's keep doing that, right? That what's going right for the customer, what's going right for the employees, what's going right for the investor. Let's keep doing that. Do not stop doing that. Uh, those things are working. Um, the next one is what's wrong. Um, how do we fix it? Is it something that, you know, that we need to prioritize? Let's see, how many things are going wrong from different perspectives that we, we all share. And if a majority of the group feels these are going wrong, whether it's a customer, an employer, an investor telling us this is going wrong, let's, let's create an action plan to fix that quickly. Um, third question we usually ask is what's misunderstood. Um, a lot of, a lot of times what we think is wrong is actually just misunderstood. Uh, we have a we have a process in place. We have a value that we're creating, but it's just misunderstood by a customer, an employer, an investor. So let's 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 make sure it's understood. Let's communicate that, recommunicate that in a way that uh, that makes sense and that uh, folks are starting to understand. And then the last piece, and and probably the most important piece going into times of uncertainty, is what's missing. Right? It's very easy to pull back. Uh, uh, from investing when you're not quite sure what's going to happen in the market. It's very easy to pull back on, on adding cost or adding resources, but very important to not forget about what's missing in the business today that's going to catapult you to the next level, that's going to create value for, um, for, for your stakeholders. Part of that question then goes into, all right, if it's missing, it, where do we prioritize what we're going to add uh, on this list, right? What is the, what is going to create the most value off of this list that's missing in the next 12 to 24 months, that's going to create a competitive advantage for us, uh, and, uh, and, and make sure that customers are excited about partnering with us and, and, and still want to continue to do business with us, even if they're faced with that decision of, I need to, I need to go without something. So, um, very important. It's a great question. Um, there's, there's a lot of uh, investment uh, today going into this space ahead of time. A lot of private equity groups 
are also very smart individuals that are, are doing these similar things and making sure that they're staying ahead of the curve. Absolutely, I'm glad to hear the chief financial officer focus so heavily on the customer and and uh, you know holistically across the uh, across the business. So, with focusing on a particular part of your career and, and diving into that here, Tim, with um, I think this Vispiro, if that's pronounced correctly, you more than we you know from previous conversations, you more than three times the revenue, you more than four times the EBITDA. So, keen to hear, keen for everyone to learn, what challenges did you face during that time? Um, and also, what do you put the success down to on this? Great question. So, so Vispero, uh, just as a quick you know, background, uh, this is the business uh, that I worked at where we were the largest provider of low vision and blindness software, right? So what could be, what other mission could be as great as that, right? So everyone was excited coming to work. You're, you're creating a solution uh, that helps someone who uh, who, who needs this software to, to function in everyday life or, or it, it, that it, it helps improve uh, someone's life. There's no better mission than that, right? And um, so, so it, it, it was exciting. I mean, everyone was excited about, about growing this company, about finding different ways uh, to grow this company. M&A was a big part of our, our revenue growth, right? So we had partnered with, uh, at that time, we had five five key acquisitions that were made. Some were in the software space, some in the hardware space, but M&A was a part of that pipeline. We knew we had a strategic plan and we knew who all the big players were in that market. And we were able to form some strategic relationships and partnerships to grow uh, our overall product for the customer and put everything kind of in one package together, which was unique, right? So um, and not only did this help private direct consumers that were using this product in everyday life, but it also helped businesses connect to um, areas that they were maybe weak on for folks who could not see well or could not see at all. Um, so part of that was around the mission, right? Um, M&A was the easy part, right? It's easy to grow a business versus revenue and EBITDA with M&A. Um, if it, and again, going back to the involved, you can't, you can't just do, m and you've got to show organic growth in order to really show that you've driven value into these businesses. And that was the most challenging part, right? You've got to be creative. Uh, a lot of these programs were uh, sponsored or um, subsidized by uh, government funds. So every year we had to go, um, we had a, a great, a great employee, Matt Ader, who is, who is still at the business and, and uh, is a huge advocate in this space. But every year and almost every month, he was in Washington, D.C., uh, advocating for, um, you know, subsidies and, and, and funding for, for these types of products. So um, not only was that uh, important in order to secure funding for folks who needed it in order to get these products, the other part of that uh, growth was really around uh, creative solutions. So what I loved about the thesis that the private equity vector capital uh, put together for this model was that they were focused on finding solutions that we didn't have. It, it, the, all five of these companies were doing something great, but they haven't pulled all of them together. So the strategic focus was to pull all of these together to create a full solution, which created a lot of challenges to be creative, to getting people to you know, uh, think about changing some things. Uh, when you get stuck in, hey, we've always done it this way, very hard to pull folks away unless you've got a really good team that's gone through some of those transformation efforts. Another part of that, you know, a lot of that was focused on revenue. On the EBITDA side, I think, you know, today it's it's hard to it's hard to go in and just cut costs and, and maintain EBITDA, right? So uh, a lot of private equity in the past had had a, a mindset of, hey, you just got bought for private equity where everyone's going to be terminated and we're going to start over, right? Uh, that's not the case these days. I mean, there's, there is um, you know, a lot of diligence that goes into understanding areas in the business where it's appropriate to cut costs and areas of the business where uh, that cost makes sense because it's driving value or it's needed to support the folks that are driving the value. 
Um, so I think one of the pieces that was a challenge here is really understanding where the true savings lied and whether or not those were ones we wanted to go after that we needed to realize. Uh, you'll hear that a uh, term called synergy a lot in this space. It you know, essentially means uh, you know, what saving opportunities are, are available in the business or what through combining all of these businesses could we get better pricing on with our vendors uh, and use that combined scale to get uh, to lower our costs. So I, I would say that the shift in, in this business uh, was more around uh, pushing our vendors, taking our combined scale and, and, and right sizing the costs uh, in the business for the combined scale we had as a, a full portfolio company rather than just an individual brand. Um, so that was a key piece to growing that EBITDA. The other piece of that um, was was making sure that again we were investing in the right places. There was investment that um, you know when 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 entrepreneur entrepreneurs are building businesses, a lot of time when it comes down to making an investment decision as a sole owner or sole partner of a business um, or a single out member LLC, you're faced with do I, do I invest this back into the business today or do I take my family on a vacation that they haven't had for five years, right? So that decision is a little bit different than a private equity group who says, hey, we've, we've, already, we've already got earmarked capital ready to deploy. A majority of that's going into M&A, but we've, we've, we've apportioned a piece of that uh, that's going to go back into growing these businesses organically. Some of those investments allowed us to drive some of that capex and, and fixed assets that were needed and some individual training for personnel uh, that was needed that helped us drive the business uh, to, to greater heights uh, and, and improve organic EBITDA growth as well. So a, a lot of value drivers in the market uh, today. I think a, a lot of uh, folks in the private equity space as well, strategic partners that are looking to grow their business through M&A. Are, are looking for things that are going to create a competitive advantage. The way you create you create value is, you know, not only just showing M&A growth and are showing organic growth, but underneath that, going back to long-term strategy, is that's great. You grew the EBITDA in the trailing 12 months. What's going to happen for me in the next three to five years while I'm holding it, right? Or what's going to happen in the next 15 years if I'm a strategic partner? Uh, with this business. So you've got to show that uh, you're strong in areas where um, marketing comes into play. Are you a market leader? Is there still opportunities in the market? Is it saturated? Is it, is it, uh, is there, is there opportunities to uh, train and develop talent and labor? Um, do you have resources like uh, raw selection or other people who can drive getting the right talent into your business? Um, and, and, and do that quickly, right? Uh, speed is important in tech and speed is important in service-based businesses. Um, making sure that you can show the EBITDA is sustainable uh, is important in this, in, this, uh, you know, in this environment. And I think a lot of what we did at Vespera, a lot of what we're doing today with Frontier Service Partners is, is driving kind of those long-term strategies to, to drive you know, not only just last 12 months revenue and EBITDA growth, but expand that for uh, for the lifetime of the company, right? So uh, taking that view set of this is a lifetime company, this is something that customers are going to connect with, we're building long-term relationships, all of these components outside of just growing revenue and, and EBITDA in the last 12 months are important. And, uh, and, and Vispero, uh, Vispero is doing well. Uh, again, a lot of the sustainable solutions that were put in place have 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 stayed, have remained, and and they're they're still going through, uh, you know, that four helpful list uh, to make sure that they're constantly reevaluating the business. So, uh, great question. It's it's important to know that underneath the the three x or four x uh, on revenue or EBITDA that's generated, there's a lot of work that goes into that uh, outside of just M and A. Absolutely. And sorry to interrupt here, just a quick note to highlight our new sponsor, Grata. The private equity market is rapidly shifting to a data-driven, proprietary deal sourcing standard. Grata provides the window into over 7 million middle market private companies. 
Contact Grata so you can access the market first. Request a demo at www.grata.com. Now back to the podcast. So you mentioned mergers and acquisitions. You, you, uh, you mentioned it's fairly easy, so I'm going to challenge you on this easiness. Um, <laughs> I know plenty of uh, portfolio companies, private equity firms that have, have been particularly challenged by m and whether that's the due diligence phase or, or whatever's let them down there. What, so tell us about your kind of, so just give a bit, bit of a picture. Obviously, this fair, you made, you know, five plus acquisitions, as I understand it. Um, what were the, t- well, tell us about your kind of integration process. So let's focus on that side of things. So I think that's where probably a lot of the fall down I see happens. How do you go about integrating multiple organizations in order to create long-term growing collective business? Yeah, you you, uh, you you called me on the easy for the M and A side. That that's never easy, but it's the it's it's the um, quickest way to drive, I guess, revenue and EBITDA growth. Um, before integration, I think it starts before integration, honestly. And this is where the I think difficulty comes into part into play is is you wanna you wanna be able to move fast. Um, we pride ourselves on being able to move fast, but through that speed, it's just like closing financial statements. You want speed and accuracy, right? Uh, the due diligence phase is the most important phase, in my opinion, uh, to m and right? Um, you're learning a business, right? You're creating a relationship. You're trying to close a business in 30, 60, you know, 90 days and learn everything about this business, learn everything about uh, the process, the people involved in this, and and make sure it's a fit strategically for 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 what you're looking to accomplish. So, you know, I I attribute due diligence very closely to to dating, right? Um, it, you're you're asking a lot of questions, uh, you're getting to know uh, this individual or this company. Uh, you're you're making sure that there's compatibility and on multiple fronts. Um, will the culture fit? Uh, is one of the number one questions we ask. Will that culture fit in what we're trying to do today? If you're a service-based business, are you are you investing in your people and your in your customers? If not, probably we've got a culture thing we've got to make sure we iron out before we before we pull a trigger on, on doing a deal. Uh, is that something we can overcome? Is it a hurdle that that's easy to get over? Or is it something that it, it's going to take us longer and we may not have a 90 day integration process. It may be 180 days before we get that piece fixed. But through that due diligence phase, we're evaluating multiple areas of the business to say, uh, to, to basically put a, put a, a, you know, plus or minus on, Hey, is this something that's going right? You know, four helpful lists. Is this something that's going right? Perfect. That checks the box. We, we feel really strongly about that. And then once we get down, not to be negative, but once we get down into the pieces that that maybe are are outside of uh, what we would typically look for, then we start to build an integration plan to say, is this an area that we can help this business improve upon? Uh, and are they open to improving uh, uh, in this area? So um, you know, one of the pieces with Vespero is uh, the the brands in the in this market were you know market leading brands um, had done you know business a certain way had developed certain technology a certain way and had done that from the start of of the business. So now we're now we're getting all of these groups together and trying to redesign, recode, develop in different ways, challenge each other. Uh, we needed to make sure that culture fit. We needed to know that these these team of developers can ma- mesh and, and work well with these team of developers. Um, outside of you know just you know making sure there's a fit culturally, um, it, it's important to look at financial statements, look at you know what legal risks lie in the business. Uh, insurance is another one that you know often gets overlooked. Uh, do do the employees have better or worse uh, benefit plans than what you're giving, what you have today? Is there some type of reevaluation you need to make in your playbook uh, based off of the company you're adding? So a lot of that is matching. I, I mentioned playbook. You'll hear Adam mention playbook uh, a lot. Um, you know, a playbook for 
a, a, a company that is, is building a long-term strategy will often include uh, areas that, um, that drive value. Like, do we have the right software and technology in, in, in the business to be able to serve our customers the best way possible? And, uh, and a lot of times when you're going through due diligence is, hey, we may not have the appropriate software. 90 day integration list. Can we get that software implemented in 90 days? Yes or no. If not, then we, we extend out our plan and make sure we've got a plan in place to, to, to be realistic with that time frame. Um, other pieces, insurance, right? The reason I mentioned insurance is because you want to make sure you understand all the underlying risks that either are we covered for that today with our current programs? Do we, are we going to fold them into our current programs? Uh, do, do we need to reevaluate our programs based off of the new business that we're adding in? So uh, all of those pieces, all of those pieces uh, have to be evaluated in that due diligence phase before you get to integration. Once that paper is signed and, and you've acquired the business, the next 24 hours are the most important hours post, post due diligence in that integration phase to make sure you've got a clear communication plan. Uh, internal communication is key on these, um, making sure that all the employees are, are, are there present, have heard the same message is really important. Um, it's the difference between kicking, kickstarting and integration and, and change-based conversations uh, to a positive outcome versus, uh, you know, it, poor, with poor communication, there's this uncertainty um, maybe a little bit of animosity. Hey, there's a new guy coming in. Is my job in jeopardy? What's going to change? We've always done things a certain way. Um, so getting ahead of that and, and having a good communication plan that, uh, within the 24 hour period after close is really important. Following that, that kind of internal communication and making sure everyone understands uh, why we partnered together and uh, what we're planning to do and what the mission is, is then to start to go and, and again, go back through the, f the first two P's, process and people and understanding. We, hopefully we did all of our homework and due diligence to highlight the areas of process, systems, and, and people that we need uh, to help us change or, or make changes. And then change is the hardest subject of all, right? Uh, the hardest part of the integration is uh, and I liken this to you know being in a canoe. Uh, um, I had uh, great friends who were who were in, in crew uh, growing up through uh, high school, and so I liken the uh, CEO to a coxswain in, in a boat, and uh, they're they're having to they're having to communicate mission, communicate changes that need to be made, and and you're going to have various people in your boat, right? Um, the the some folks are going to be um, disappointed that you're changing the direction we're rowing, right? <laughs> and some of those folks are going to either, you know, most, most of them are going to probably row harder in the opposite direction of where you're telling them to go. Some folks right on day one are going to jump on, uh, jump on and say, man, I, I believe in the mission. This is fantastic. We've been waiting for that. They're going to turn around in the boat and row the right direction or row the direction you're, you're trying to get everyone named to. And then you're going to have, you're going to have two other two other types of situations that are difficult situations that you just got to manage through and, and you've got to have good action plans in place for some people are going to on their own say this isn't the boat for me i'm jumping out of the boat right um and that's that's okay so you want to make sure you've got a, a culture that's supporting the mission um on the other side of that is there may be people that don't belong in the boat and that's the most difficult situation that you're going to get into is you know, who, who doesn't belong in the boat, who are, who are folks that are actively um, driving the business away from change uh, that's needed, right? Um, so a lot of that comes back to communication. Um, we've been very fortunate, um, Frontier Service Partners, we've got a lot, of, uh, a lot of great people that believed in the mission, great communication up front, great private equity group, uh, Imperial Capital out of Toronto, uh, did a great job just making sure that the mission was communicated. And so happy to say we've got a lot of folks rowing in the same direction. Now we're on to, we're trying to take the canoe and make it a speedboat, right? So putting in 
you know, processes, uh, systems, and uh, investing in talent to kind of create the motor to, to speed up um, speed up the process or add additional uh, companies or folks to to the platform. So again, it, it's it like you said, it's not it's not easy. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into the front end and due diligence that makes the integration easier. And, and we'll get to this in my favorite books, but there's a great book, um, that, that I, um, that I love that is great about just kind of what's important in the first, uh, 90 days after, after any type of change, whether it's an integration, uh, of buying a new business, or it's a, it's a big rollout, big change, big software change. What's important in those, in those first 90 days. Well, you mentioned mentioned about books. A classic question for me is about influences. So let's jump into it as you've nicely uh, guided us into that. What are your influences? What do you recommend others read, watch, listen? Well, Adam did not pay me to do this, but it's the absolute best book in the space, especially for folks who are in the HVAC plumbing electrical business, uh, the industry I'm in today. Uh, this book was fantastic, uh, recommended to me by a close mentor of mine, and uh, Adam has two books out. Private Equity Playbook is, is a book that if you haven't read it and you're in the private equity space or you're interested in private equity and what that's all about, it is the, in, in, a, in, a, in essence, it's, it's the manual to private equity. <laughs> um, he had another book called The Exit Strategy Playbook, which is, which is also phenomenal. Um, it goes into a little bit more depth once you're an entrepreneur or you're an executive at the stage of where you're potentially going to exit, uh, whether that's sell to a private equity group or sell to a strategic partner. Uh, it's an excellent book to understand mechanics of that. And, and it's a, a great way to kind of break it down. And he, he does, he does a phenomenal job of, of kind of telling it through a story and through his own experiences that kind of draws you in. It's, it's uh, a lot of books on, private equity that you read that you've read in the past aren't like this book it's it's an entertaining exciting uh, hard to put down book uh, I would say both books if you've if you got a two or three hour flight uh, you can get those knocked out pretty easy it's an easy read um, and, and great content um, one of my key staple books uh, I have everyone uh, who uh, who has worked for me or worked with me uh, I highly recommend this book. It's Stephen Covey's Seven Habits to Highly Effective People. A lot of businesses we've talked about is uh, it's important to understand how 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 to change a business, how to evolve a business, how to adapt, how to execute. Very hard to do that if you don't know how to be effective yourself. Uh, this book does a great job. One of the key habits in there that I think are often un underlooked uh, or overlooked. Sorry. Um, is, is to seek to understand others' uh, perspectives before your own, right? Then to be understood or have your perspective understood. Um, and that's important when you're trying to transform a business and, and, and effectively change a business or get folks to row in that same direction with you on that canoe. Um, the one we talked about during uh, the integration uh, topic was uh, Matt, Michael Watkins has a, a great book called The First 90 Days. Uh, it was given to me by my mentor, Rick Simpson, uh, phenomenal CFO, very experienced in the private equity space, uh, has done a number of transactions and, uh, and, and gave me this book and said, this was kind of your template to making sure that you're successful in the first 90 days of anything, right? Uh, whether that's starting a new job as an executive with a private equity group or, or a strategic group, um, whether that's buying a new business, whether that's implementing a new software, uh, the fundamental strategy laid out in the first 90 days uh, is, is critical, uh, critical information, great content to, to making sure that you, you have the most impact you can and get off on the right, on the right foot. Another one that, you know, the, the, the book title sounds, uh, sounds funny, but I absolutely love the content behind it is Ken Blanchard uh, had wrote The One Minute Manager. Uh, this is really important for executives that are part of a high paced private equity group. It's something I, I still continue to struggle with because I, to some extent, am a perfectionist and, and want things done a certain way, but um, it, it's really about 
um, investing in your people and pushing back to your people to become more solution oriented employees uh, versus problem. Uh, I've always got a problem. I'm not coming to you with a solution. Uh, instead of having uh, conversations where a problem's just presented, it's uh, let's have a problem presented, but have you thought through um, what it's going to, what, what kind of solutions we could put in place before, before you came to me, right? So it's that pushback of before we have this conversation, I want you to think first, how, how do you think we should solve this from your perspective? You seem to be in the best seat to help and have a, a strong perspective. Let's make sure that I, I want to make sure that I'm evaluating what solution you may already have in place. That's helped me significantly to reduce meeting times. Uh, we get through meetings a lot faster. So would, would highly recommend that. It's also an easy read. I would say you could probably read that one in an hour on a plane. Fantastic read. I'm going to maybe list two, two, personal, two personal books that are maybe less business, but uh, still kind of tie back into uh, just becoming overall, just kind of developing uh, folks and developing yourself. But uh, I absolutely, I, I guilty as charged, love Chip and Joanna Gaines. Uh, I'm uh, on the side, my wife and I do a lot of home renovation projects and uh, we've absolutely fallen in love with their family. Uh, Chip has a great book uh, called Capital Gains, spelled like their last name, G-A-I-N-E-S. And uh, the title of the book underneath that says, Smart Things I Learned While Doing Dumb Stuff, right? And so it's a very fun book about entrepreneurs um, and how taking chances, taking leaps of faith uh, have rewards. So calculating, cal you know, having a, a calculated risk and, uh, and just jumping in and, and starting to execute. Um, they've built an absolute empire um, there. And it's, it's based around that personality, that entrepreneurial pursuit. And it's just something that I, you know, I, I think, I tie into well. The last one is Ron Chernow's Alexander Hamilton. Um, you know, this one for me, um, I, I was never much of a history buff uh, throughout school, but this one, his story just kind of speak spoke to me and just the work ethic side. So I think in private equity, you've got to have a level of work ethic. I think reading uh, Alexander Hamilton uh, the, the bio biography there is enough to motivate anyone to work harder. So, uh, great story about an, an immigrant who came from nothing and worked his way up to, uh, being a founding father of the United States of America. And I know you're in England, so don't hold that against me. But, um, again, just, just great, a great message for work ethic, right? So, um, making sure that, uh, you know, it just kind of, it kind of re-motivates you to say, hey, you know, what I'm going through today is not anywhere close to what uh, these folks had to do in order to build a country. So um, great, just kind of great book, just to kind of make sure uh, you're waking up fresh in the morning and, uh, and feel motivated about what you got to get accomplished for the rest of the day. Absolutely love them. Yeah, the uh, all the first ones except for the final two I've not read. Actually, the first ninety days is uh, is a book we uh, we share with every uh, candidate we uh, introduce into a new business. Uh, the Ken Blanchard One Minute Manager was introduced to me a long time ago, and first management books that I read, and uh, some of the great ones, uh, classic Stephen Covey type stuff in there as well. So, yeah, some really uh, really really great books um, certainly from there. So, um, certainly love all of uh, all of that. Um, if anybody wants to, to reach out to you, Tim, how best do they get in touch? How best do they, uh, um, you know, drop me a line? Perfect. I am an active social media user. I've got LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, um, a Snapchat, everything you could possibly imagine. Um, LinkedIn's probably the best if you want to reach me quickly. Uh, Tim O'Reilly um, at Frontier Service Partners. Uh, if, uh, if, if email is... Um, if you want to send an email, if that's better than social media, my email's Tim, T I M dot O'Reilly, O R E I L L Y, at frontierservicepartners.com. Um, open to anyone who wants to uh, reach out. Uh, and, uh, and, and I love giving back. Um, I've been very fortunate to have strong mentors uh, that have helped me get to where I am today. So I'm also looking to help other 
uh, up and comers uh, and, and folks who are rising to, to take key roles with private equity groups. Um, last thing too, from me is, I think, you know, from all of these books and all of our conversations, I think, you know, three things that I found have been, uh, have helped me be most successful in this space is, you know, making sure you have the right attitude coming in every day uh, as an executive or as a business owner coming into these businesses, you've got to start, your attitude starts with you. Uh, if you have a great attitude coming in, uh, it makes a difference. Uh, other folks start to attach to you and, and you start to build that culture of positive thinking. Uh, the other piece of that is you've got to have work ethic. I think um, we, we've kind of hammered that one with uh, Ron Chanel's book, but you've got to have a strong work ethic. And then everything else that you've learned from your experience and your education comes after those two things. So um, appreciate the time, Alex. Uh, I look forward to staying connected. If uh, there's anything I can do for your listeners or anything I can do for you, happy to help. I think you've done a damn sight a uh, lot today, Tim. So thank you. Uh, certainly, thank you very much for that. You've left lots of value, you shared lots of processes, um, loads of energy, loads of you know drive, and clearly in an industry you love. And thank you for being in private equity and bringing all the passion and uh, drive on, that you demonstrated today, no doubt, into, into growing those businesses. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. And as always, for our listeners, thank you very much for, for joining us. Uh, should you ever need support with your private equity professionals or, of course, portfolio executive hiring across Europe and North America, please do reach out to us at Raw Selection. But till the next time, keep smashing it. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you for listening to the Private Equity Podcast on www.raw-selection.com. 